Hi folks. So my name's Kerry Lewis and I am a lecturer here at Aberystwyth. I teach in the law school and before I was a lawyer I worked as an environmental solicitor in the city in London. But really at heart I'm beach bum. Ever since I first went in the sea at six months old. I lived in the city. Sorry, okay. I lived in the city for quite a long time. It turned out that that didn't really suit me very well. I'm not a city dweller. And uh, after I'd qualified as a solicitor, I ran away, I left, and I went to Mexico. And I'd realised that I'd been spending more and more time going away at weekends and, and so on. And I realised that where I wanted to be was on the coast and in the water. So I went to Mexico and I did what was my first marine conservation project. I learned about how to survey coral reef. Um, I also spent some time monitoring turtle nests, which was really exciting, going out in the middle of the night, finding female turtles nesting, and then monitoring those nests until the uh, hatchlings came out and making sure that as many as possible of them got into the water. Uh, the other thing we did in Mexico was crocodile nesting surveys in these mangroves. Um, which basically involved clambering, clambering around through mangrove roots, trying to find crocodile nests. I found this slightly anxiety provoking. <laughs> and when I asked what I was supposed to do if I found a crocodile, I was told run zigzag. <laughs> I, didn't think, I didn't think that was, you know, a particularly safe way of going about things, but that was what we did. Anyway, um, at the end of this project, at the end of my volunteering, I was actually invited to stay on um, and work there. But a very strange thing happened, and I said no, and I decided to come home. And I think what was happening was that I had a thing called hirai, this sense of longing and of wanting to come back and come back to where I'd grown up. And I had this idea that I didn't need, actually, to go to the other side of the world to find things that were really special. There were special things right on my doorstep. So I came back to Pembrokeshire, and I got involved with various diving projects. So most of the diving I do is down in Pembrokeshire. Um, I do a lot of photography. So these are some of my favourite things I see in the water. These are sea slugs. Um, they're very interesting. They're very pretty. They're very little. So it's very exciting when you find one because they're really difficult to find. Um, but they're also quite interesting. They can tell us, um, in a sense, that there are lots of other things. If we see lots of different sea slugs, we know that we're seeing lots of other things in the water because every sea slug <coughs> is adapted to eat a very particular species. And they have these funny little, they're called radula, they have these tongues which are adapted to eat a very particular species. So if you see a sea slug, you know that the food it eats must also be there. These pictures are all taken in the waters around Stromer Island. Um, and there, over the years, they've recorded over 60 species of sea slug just around Stone Island. Um, one of the projects that I participate in is called Sea Search. It's run by the Marine Conservation Society. And it trains divers to go out and basically collect habitat data and collect species data um, so that that can go into the uh, central database called Marine Recorder and we can find out more about what is happening, what there is out there in our oceans. <coughs> this photograph is of a red blenny. Um, it's a fish that is not particularly <coughs> rare, but actually until I saw that at the Smalls Lighthouse just off the coast of Pembrokeshire last year, it had never been seen in Wales. Now, that's not to say that anything's changed. It's not to say that it's an indicator of global warming or any of those things. It simply shows that there's an awful lot we don't know. It lives in very exposed areas, so areas that are difficult to get to, areas that it's not easy to dive in. Um, and there are all sorts of things that we still have to learn about the ocean. I also find out lots of really fascinating things. This little blob of jelly is a sea squirt. What I find incredible about this is that it's a chordate. <coughs> that means it's in the same group of animals that we are as humans, this tiny little blob of jelly. And in its larval stage, it has the beginnings of a notochord, which in humans is what would become the spine, the spinal column. And yet it's this tiny little blob of jelly that just sits there on the rock looking not particularly special. I caught this one in a delicate moment. That one is having a poo. 
The other project I work with uh, as a volunteer is NARC. It's Neptune's Army of Rubbish Collectors, and it's a group of divers who spend time, again, around the coast of Pembrokeshire, collecting ghost fishing gear. So every year, um, all sorts of fishing gear is lost through no fault of the fishermen. It's just um, out there at sea, things happen. Um, and it's an indication of the pressures that are facing the marine environment. So this is just an example <coughs> of a big uh, lot of fishing line that we collected on one trip. But there are all sorts of pressures facing the marine environment. One of them is overfishing. Current estimates, reports are suggesting that 85% of the world's fisheries are at or beyond safe ecological limits for fishing. Um, another pressure is marine plastics. There are reports at the moment that are suggesting that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish. It's terrifying. Um, another pressure, obviously, is climate change. The seas are warming, and as the temperature goes up, so does the ecosystem change, so do the habitats change that these animals are trying to survive in. But all of these things happen very gradually. They're not immediate. They don't happen rapidly. And what happens is because they happen so gradually, it creates a kind of new normal. And it means that as time changes and as generations move on, the baseline shifts. And what we think of as normal changes. And it's something that's been called shifting baseline syndrome. So that each new generation thinks that what they are seeing is the natural normal condition of the environment. Now, in response to some of these pressures, the World Conservation <coughs> Congress has suggested that we should be protecting more of the world's oceans. And they suggest that by 2030, we should have 30% of the oceans in fully protected marine reserves. So that means areas where there is no extractive activity taking place, mm -hmm. so that we're not fishing, for example, in that area. We've got a long way to go. At the moment, a little over 1% of the global oceans are protected in reserves of this type. Why would we do it? Well, it's a response to those pressures. There are benefits. There are some of these areas around the world, no-take zones or highly protected marine reserves. And studies have shown that they can improve the populations in those areas. So the animals in those areas are, have better breeding success. The individuals that live in those areas are bigger. They spread. There's a thing called overspill. So the animals don't stay in the area. They don't know where the boundary of the zone is. And they will move out into the areas around it. So they will increase the abundance in the waters around it, which can be a benefit for fishermen. It can also be a benefit for tourism, because people can come and see what this area now looks like that is doing so much better. And it potentially could restore the baseline. It could take us back to what the old normal used to look like. So how are we doing in Wales? Well, fantastic news by the looks of things. We've got 50% of Welsh waters that are protected in marine protected areas. And what we can see here, all of those, all of those shaded areas on that map are marine protected areas. But here's the thing. <coughs> of those, none of them are free from extractive activity. The special areas of conservation and the special protection areas that cover most of it are designated for very specific features. So, for example, Cardigan Bay is a special area of conservation. It's designated for the bottlenose dolphin, among other things. It's also designated for some of its habitats, so some of its sandbanks <coughs> and some of its, some of its reefs. But extractive activities are still allowed to go ahead, and there's a debate going on at the moment about whether we should have scallop dredging going on in Cardigan Bay. The more um, alert amongst you will notice that those percentages don't add up to 50%, and that's because there's a lot of overlap, but the overall amount is 50%. The other thing about these areas, special areas of conservation and special protection areas that are taking up 
most of the time, most of the uh, coverage, are actually European sites. So we're not sure what's going to happen to these as we leave the European Union. But there's one very special area that I want to talk to you about, and that's SCOMA Marine Conservation Zone. You probably can't see it on this map. There's a very tiny little orange blob. So I've zoomed in for you. It's still a very tiny little orange blob, okay? It's 13 square kilometres, and it's less than 0.1% of Welsh waters. The designation of this site is slightly different than the others because it's not designated for <coughs> a particular feature. It's designated for the general flora and fauna in the area. It's been protected for a long time, and it's an area where we know we've got a lot of information. There's been a lot of research going on there for a long time. There are lots of bylaws in place. So one of the things is that there is no dredging, and there is no bottom trawling. So the uh, seabed habitats there have been able to recover, and we've been able to see what that means. It's also unlawful to take a scallop. So if I go out diving and I come out of the water with one scallop, I can be fined £5,000 and I can have all my dive kit taken off me as my sanction. But it's not a no-take zone. It's not completely free of extractive activity. So this is a lobster pot. It's completely lawful that that lobster pot is there. And the rope at the side is the buoy to the surface. And there's all sorts of angling line caught up on it. Angling is also allowed in the reserve. And that starry smooth hand, which is kind of shark, has been attracted by that fishing gear that appears to be still fishing. And it's got tangled up and it's not been able to leave. So my buddy's actually managed to cut free this fish. And although it was in an emaciated state, it had obviously been there quite a long time, it actually swam free and off it went. It was rescued. Happy story. <coughs> okay. The other thing about fishing gear is that when you're dropping a lobster pot, you can't see where it's going to land. Now, this is a sea fan. It's a gorgonian. It's a type of soft coral, and it's very, very slow growing. It grows at about 10 millimetres a year. It's very lucky that that pot landed where it did. Equally, if there was a strong swell, it's quite possible that that pot is going to knock that fan over. And because it's so delicate and because it's so slow growing, it's going to take a very long time to restore. And if that's happening at all kinds of different places around the habitat, <coughs> the damage may occur. The sea fans also support other life. Now, this is one of my little mysteries. This is one of my favorite things. This is another sea slug. You can just see it in the middle of the picture there. It's twisted around the sea fan. And this is the pink sea fan slug. It lives on sea fans, and it only eats sea fans. But it's weird. You can dive most of the year and not see a slug on this sea fan. And then at some point in maybe June, they appear on a few of the sea fans around the reserve. They lay their eggs, they hang out for a few weeks, and then they disappear again. I've got no idea where they go. So... 0% of no-take zones in Wales. Nowhere near, not even started on that 30% target that the World Conservation Congress has proposed by 2030. So we've got a very long way to go. But here's some good news. We've got legislation in Wales that the Marine and Coastal Access Act allows the designation of marine conservation zones for the general conservation of flora and fauna. It doesn't matter if the species are rare or threatened. And the Welsh ministers have got the powers, if they choose to do so, to make this a highly protected marine conservation zone and to create bylaws to make sure that there are no <coughs> extractive activities within SCOMA marine conservation zone. That 0.1% of Welsh waters could be our first step towards this 30% by 2030 goal. It would contribute to a fantastically piece of progressive legislation and progressive ambition in Wales that is called the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. It's got a number of goals that we're trying to achieve, one of which is the Resilient Wales Goal. So we're looking for a nation which maintains and enhances a biodiversity <coughs> environment. It's about trying to protect our ecosystems. It's forward-looking, and it's long-term. 
It also would contribute to the principle of sustainable development, which is in an, a principle in international law, which is also enshrined in Welsh legislation. And it's about ensuring that future generations are able to meet their needs. If we took this first step of protecting this tiny little bit of sea around Scoma, we would be protecting <coughs> something that we are borrowing from our future generations. So, I hope you'll agree that it's time to have marine reserves in Wales. The creation of a no-take zone around Scoma Island would contribute to these goals. It would allow a return to the old normal. It would give us a chance to see what that old baseline looks like. And it would give future generations a chance to really learn and see what a properly protected, a properly looked after marine environment would look like. Thank you very much.